So hi, I'm Ranger Jen. There we go. We are official now. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ranger Jen. I work at National Mall and Memorial Parks in Washington, D.C. I'm thrilled today to have uh, my friends from Hyde Park and the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site here to um, uh, join us in honor of Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday. And we are able to host on this Zoom platform thanks to the, the help of our uh, friends and partner at the Trust for the National Mall. So I'm gonna turn it over briefly here to Edward and he will say a, a few words and then we'll get going. Edward. Well, thanks so much, Jen. So as Jen mentioned, I'm Edward. I'm the Director of Public Engagement Programs at the Trust for the National Mall. The Trust is the lead nonprofit partner of the Park Service on the National Mall here in Washington, DC, the nation's capital. What does that mean? It means we're partners and we help each other out on big projects. Part of what we do is share the many surprising stories that bring the National Mall to life and connect other parks and historic sites across the Park Service and the country. Today, we're very proud to host rangers from Hyde Park in New York so that we can learn more about Eleanor Roosevelt in celebration of her upcoming birthday, about her many accomplishments, and also about her bravery. Thank you for letting us into your classroom. We hope you take away the importance of facing your fears and of working together. We're so glad to have you. So Jen, back to you. Thank you, Edward and Aaron behind the scenes for um, making this happen for us today. And I am very excited to pass this on to my friends at Hyde Park, um, Ranger Danny and Ranger Kevin. They are gonna join us today. We're gonna talk some about Eleanor Roosevelt, as you heard, and share some stories, take you on a little virtual field trip here to a couple of different sites that relate back to Eleanor Roosevelt. So Ranger Danny, you're gonna start us off. Yes, so I'm just gonna uh, load the presentation. Um, so. I should mention too, that if you have any questions along the way, we're gonna ask some questions of you. Um, but if you have questions along the way, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. We'll be checking that out as we go. And we look forward to engaging with you. So if you have some, uh, some questions, uh, please let us know. So uh, my presentation is taking a second to load. Um, so I just wanna introduce myself. Uh, my name is Danielle Massaro and I work at the uh, Roosevelt Vanderbilt National Historic Site in Hyde Park, New York. And um, so we have uh, three, uh, a number of sites that are associated uh, with, uh, with, with our uh, site here. So we have uh, the home of Franklin Roosevelt and uh, the home of Eleanor Roosevelt at Bell Hill, where we're gonna be going on a little virtual field trip today. And as soon as I can get my, uh, my screen to share, so actually hold on one second, so I think, okay. Okay, so, why is it not? Okay, so uh, can everybody see my screen? We can see it, it's a little blurry, okay. but we can see it. Okay, that's, it's on, it's not blurry on my end, so I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, okay, so, um, as I was saying, uh, today we are going to take a virtual field trip uh, to Valk Hill, uh, to two sites actually, to Valk Hill, which is uh, the home of Eleanor Roosevelt, located at the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site, and part of the Roosevelt uh, Vanderbilt National Historic Site, and the Eleanor Roosevelt statue, which is located um, at the Franklin D. Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. So you're going to be visiting both of those sites today and talking a little bit about Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and the way that she celebrated her birthdays and uh, some of the things that she did over the course of her life. 
So um, we're going to be talking about how Eleanor Roosevelt was first lady four times, which is more than any other woman ever was first lady or ever will be first lady uh, since they changed the rule after Franklin Roosevelt was president about how many times she could be president. And so we're going to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt and the things that she did and the things that she accomplished. And um, you're going to meet rangers from our site here uh, at the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site and uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt statue in Washington, D.C. And so uh, we're going to talk about how Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, as I said, celebrated her birthday and how she, over the course of her life, life worked to overcome her fears. And uh, as was mentioned, you'll get a chance to answer some, uh, ask and answer some questions about Eleanor Roosevelt. So just to get us started, uh, some things about Eleanor Roosevelt to know. So, uh, so since today we're talking about her birthday and uh, Ranger Kevin here at the site is going to talk about uh, some of the, uh, the things that Eleanor Roosevelt said about her birthdays and how she celebrated her birthdays over the years. So she was born in October, uh, October 11th, 1884 and she lived until November 7th, 1962. So this would be her 138th uh, birthday this year. And her parents were named Elliot and Anna Roosevelt she had two brothers named Elliot Jr. and Hall. And so she was actually raised by her grandmother not too far from here, uh, where we are in Hyde Park in Tivoli, New York. And uh, she attended Allenswood School in England when, uh, by the time she was 15 years old until she was 18 years old. So since her parents passed away, she was raised by her grandmother after she was 10. And we're gonna talk a little more later on about how she overcame her childhood fears, things that she was afraid of. Uh, such as the dark and mice and strangers and swimming and a lot of other things that she was afraid of because she had kind of um, a rough start in life, a rough childhood, and that kind of made her develop a lot of, uh, a lot of things that she was afraid of. So uh, she was born in New York City, but she lived later on at Valkill, her cottage in Hyde Park, Hyde Park that we're going to be taking a virtual visit to today. So to get us started off, I thought it would be fun to, uh, to play a little game that I like to play with students called uh, Two Truths and a Lie. So two of these things that I'm gonna, these facts that I'm gonna put on the screen about Eleanor Roosevelt are true, and one of them is not true. So if the teachers wanna take uh, maybe like a poll in the class and, and have the, uh, the students tell us which one of these they think is not true about Eleanor Roosevelt. So A, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote 27 books. B, Eleanor was her middle name and C, Eleanor never flew in an airplane. So which one of these facts about Eleanor Roosevelt do you think is not true? So you can put the answers uh, in the chat. And I can, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds then I can keep going and you can, uh, you can keep putting your answers in the chat while we're talking about other things. You must be thinking hard. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm gonna move on. Uh, so uh, actually, because I'm gonna have to. Uh... Oh, I got a C. Oh, okay. So C is actually uh, the right answer. So uh, C, Eleanor never flew in an airplane um, is, is actually the one that's not true about her because Eleanor was a world traveler and she went on uh, some airplane flights that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on about how she overcomes her fears and is able to do that. So yeah, she wrote 27 books, that is true. She wrote three autobiographies and two dozen other books. And Eleanor was actually her middle name. Her first name was Anna, which was also her mother's name. And that's actually also what she named her daughter, Anna. So her name was actually Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. So um, Ranger Kevin is going to talk a little bit today about Eleanor Roosevelt's birthdays and uh, the way that she celebrated her birthdays and uh, some things that she said and thought about birthdays. All right, well, good afternoon and uh, hello from Hyde Park. Uh, I'm Ranger Kevin and I am uh, one of the park rangers at the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site, Valkill Cottage. And we're happy to be here and joining you um, virtually today and speaking about a pretty special lady's birthday. She would have been 138 years old this year. And although her birthday is four days away still, I think you'll probably agree it's never too early to start a birthday, right? Especially if there's cake. Although sometimes Eleanor Roosevelt didn't say she was celebrating her birthday because well, you only have one of those the day you were born. 
Instead, she celebrated the anniversary of her birth. Now, we talked a little bit about Eleanor already, but she was a, an American political figure, a diplomat, an activist. Uh, she served as First Lady of the United States from 1933 to 1945 during her, her husband's uh, term in office, uh, four terms in office, and that made her the longest serving first lady in the country's history. She served as a U.S. delegate to the United Nations uh, from 1945 to 1952, and for that, President Harry Truman gave her the, the, the nickname the First Lady of the World in tribute to her human rights accomplishments. And she also wrote um, a series of columns called My Day, and they were published in newspapers around the country uh, from 1936 to 1962, and, and she writes about many things throughout these columns, um, you know, world events, maybe funny things that happened at home, and it's similar to what we would, would talk about today as having a blog. And birthdays, of course, are, are time to celebrate, um, but the older you get, birthdays are more of a time to reflect. And in her, her October 19th, uh, October 15th or 13th, 1959, uh, My Day column, she talked about this. She said, I want to thank all the many people who were kind enough to think of me on my 75th anniversary and who sent me their good wishes by telegraph and letter. It gave me a feeling of great pleasure to realize that I had so many friends and that they had wished me well after so many years of living. Birthdays really have little meaning except that I think as you grow older, they give you a heightened appreciation of gratitude you should have for every extra day that is granted you. Therefore, you should enjoy each day more and you hope that you can bring some joy into the lives of others. I am grateful for the many opportunities that have been given me and I hope that as long as I live, I may be able to use these opportunities usefully. I think she teaches us a pretty great lesson there. Everyone should try to enjoy each day and try to make other people happy. It's the really the little things in, in life that, uh, that she looked at. You know, maybe we can all try and live a little bit more like Eleanor Roosevelt and try to bring joy to at least one person each day because we can all make a difference. And I think that would make Eleanor Roosevelt happy. And little things like this can turn into bigger things. She said, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world, yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. She thinks that we can all make a difference because just one little things in our homes, our schools, our churches, our communities can, can really leave a, a big impact. And well, it has to start somewhere. Sometimes she would have visitors to her home in Hyde Park uh, for her birthday. She was a, a big supporter of the Wiltwick School. Um, the photo that I have behind me is, is Eleanor Roosevelt receiving gifts from some of the Wiltwick School. And she helped raise funds for this school to, to help pay to keep it running. And she hosted a picnic each year for them, and sometimes they would show up for her birthday. From her October 11th, um, 1954 My Day column, I am 70 today, and I began writing this on Monday, October 11th. I feel that my birthday really began Sunday the 10th, since at 3 p.m., all the little boys from Wiltwick School, 100 of them, appearing, appeared at my uh, Hyde Park cottage. I thought six or seven would come, as usually happens on my birthday, and I had prepared lemonade for that many. When I saw all of them tumbling out of the bus, I decided we should have no lemonade or cake. But I have wonderful, wonderful people in my house, and after all the children had sung Happy Birthday and Home on the Range and one or two other songs, there appeared a table behind me for the children to put their presents on. They lined up in a long queue and gave me their little handmade cards and gifts. Weaving potholders and even small rugs is quite a hobby with them. And now I have enough for both the cottage at Hyde Park and the apartment in New York for some time. They also have learned to make uh, all sorts of other little novelties. And I find my gifts were much appreciated by our own children. By the time every one of the boys had handed me his gift, another table had appeared. And though the cake was sliced very thin, there was enough to go around. 
Somehow the lemonade and orange juice mix managed to hold out for a hundred cups. And there was even a cup left over for each of our own children who had been helping. In 1954, someone had sent her a novelty greeting card for her birthday. It was an ivory back scratcher. The card said, happy birthday to someone who has everything. She mentioned though that she knew few people who had everything. So do you think it's possible to have everything? Are there some things that are more important than others that you may consider that you do have everything, maybe your health, family, love? What would you consider having everything? And what would you consider to be the greatest or most memorable gift that you've ever received? So yeah, you can feel free to put your answers uh, to the question that Ranger Kevin asked in the chat about any of the things that he was just talking about, about Eleanor Roosevelt and the way that uh, she thought about birthdays and the importance of birthdays or uh, the most memorable birthday, birthday gift you've ever gotten, uh, like the back scratcher that Kevin talked about that, uh, that Mrs. Roosevelt wrote about in my day. So you can put uh, your answers in the chat um, as, we're, as we're moving forward uh, into the, uh, the rest of the presentation. You can feel free to share uh, in the chat some of those, those answers with us. Somebody got a baby brother. Oh, oh, well, that's a good gift. Well, hopefully you thought it was a good gift. A cousin, an electric <laughs> scooter. <laughs> some good stuff here. A bike. Thank you all so much for sharing. Wow, really cool. Oh, again, maybe I'll leave, I can leave this up for another a little bit while you're, you're putting your answers in the chat. A PS5, a trampoline, a switch. Ooh. Would Eleanor Roosevelt know what some of these things are? <laughs> I bet she'd be kind of confused. Do we have any switch. pictures of Eleanor Roosevelt on a trampoline? I'd like to see that. <laughs> Oh, we can, maybe we can Photoshop one of those. That'd be fun. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed those gifts. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Mm. I'm sure Eleanor uh, Roosevelt would have loved to hear about, about all of those gifts. She always liked for everybody to get the gifts that they wanted. She really cared more about uh, giving gifts to people. So when they came here to Valkill, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt would always make sure to, uh, to, to have presents for everybody who came here. And she really didn't care too much about the gifts that they brought she would like to get things that she could give to other people. So sometimes uh, some of her friends said that she liked to get things like a big cheese or uh, boxes of um, drinks or things that she could give to other people. And so uh, she, she always liked to make sure that everybody was happy to, with the things that they got uh, with their birthday presents or their Christmas presents. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Valkill. So the, the place, uh, one of the places that we're, we're, you're visiting virtually today. So you can see a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt here at Valkill uh, with her dog, uh, Fala. So uh, Fala came here to live, the President Roosevelt's dog, uh, Fala, his little Scotty, he came here to live after the president passed away. So Fala lived here and so did uh, some of the other Scotty, some of Fala's uh, sons and, and grandsons lived here over the years. So that's why my picture uh, behind me, hopefully you can see it, uh, is of a uh, little stuffed Scotty on top of the TV and, and Eleanor's office. She loved, the Roosevelt's love dogs and, and Scotty's in particular. So her home at Valkill, you can see a little map of it and a picture of what it looks like. So when uh, folks come to visit here at Valkill, this is where they come in to, for tours on the picture on the bottom. You can see that porch on the right. So that's where you would come to visit and, and go through into her, her house for a tour. And her office is, is right uh, past that porch inside of there. And you can see a little map of Valkill. So the grounds here at Valkill and all the different buildings that are here. So we have her cottage uh, that you can see in Stone Cottage, which is another cottage that was built here on the grounds for her friends, Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman who live there. And then some of the other buildings that are here on the grounds. And Eleanor really loved being here at Valkill. It was her favorite place in the world. She didn't live here full time. So when her husband Franklin was alive, she would have split her time between here and the big house, Springwood, which was uh, Franklin's mother's house. And so, uh, but she, she would like to come here as much as possible and, and be here as much as possible because she felt 
uh, that this was the place where she said she, she came to learn to grow and to become an individual. And she really felt that this was her, her place, her place where she could come and relax and think and get all the work done that she wanted to do. And that was, that was an awful lot of work uh, as Kevin was talking about before um, her newspaper column and the books that she wrote. So I would uh, like to ask everybody if maybe there's a place that like that for you, a place like Valkyll um, that, you, that you can go where you feel safe and comfortable and you feel like you're able to, to get things done or that you're able to relax and, and feel good about yourself, just like how Eleanor Roosevelt felt at Valkyll. And we love when people come here and they get to experience uh, the, the property here and the house here, and they can really get an idea of why Eleanor Roosevelt loved it here so much. So I, I always ask when students come here, if there's a place like that uh, for them and uh, how they feel about that place. So you can feel free to share that in the chat if there's a, if any students or anyone has a, a place like that, that they like, that they have in their lives. So something that I wanted to talk about today was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was when she was a little girl, she had a, uh, she had a lot of things that she was afraid of because of all the, the things that happened to her when she was a little girl, when she lost her parents and some of the challenges that she had to face. And she was really uh, nervous about a lot of things. Like I said before about the dark and strangers and the water. And so over the course of her life, she, every time she conquered one of those fears, it made her stronger. And she said um, that basically when she said when she was little, looking back that she was always afraid of something. And so she was afraid of the dark, of, she was afraid of uh, worrying about pleasing people. And so she said that anything that she accomplished had to be done through a barrier of fear. But every time that she did uh, face one of those fears, she felt that she, as she said, she could face the next horror that comes along. So every time she did something that she was nervous about or scared of, she, she was able to, to face the next hard thing that came along. So I wanted to talk a little bit about those things today. But we have, I see some things popping up in the chat. So I don't know if we'd like to share a couple of those things uh, before we move on. Yeah, so some of the places that you had asked about, um, some of our, our friends here today have said my house, my grandma's house, and my school. So places where they feel comfortable, like Val Kill was to Eleanor. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to have a place like that. And Eleanor certainly loved it. She, when she was younger, she lived in her grandmother's house and she went away to school, to boarding school. And then she lived in a lot of the houses where she lived or her mother-in-law's houses really. And so Eleanor didn't always feel at home there. So when she was able to have her home here at Valkyll, uh, she felt like she finally had her own place that was hers and, and she could decorate it the way she wanted and, and uh, spend time here with the people that she wanted to invite and, and really have everything set up the way that she wanted it. So it's nice when we have a place like that, maybe your bedroom, you know, you're able to, to set up like that uh, or places that uh, where you, again, where you feel where you feel comfortable and happy. So some of the things that uh, I wanted to talk to you about today about Eleanor Roosevelt and some of the ways that she overcame her fears. So you can see this, it's a, a black and white photo from when she was uh, very young. So it's a little grainy, but this is a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt when she was growing up at her grandmother's house, which was a big house called Oak Terrace. And she was kind of nervous and scared and lonely. She had her horse and she loved to ride horses, but you can see she seems like a little shy and a little sad and nervous. And so as time went on, she realized, as like I said before, that she had to really work to face her fear. So all those things that she said that she was afraid of when she was little, the dark and strangers and uh, disappointing people or, or making mistakes. Every time that she faced one of those fears, she felt that she got stronger. And so you can see some of the pictures of her and her family as, uh, as time went on. Her husband, Franklin, had polio, which was a, a disease that made him not be able to use his legs. So Eleanor had to help him with a lot of the things that he needed to do. And uh, she had to raise, help raise their children after polio, after FDR got polio. She had to sometimes uh, be uh, both a mother and a father in some ways to some of the, to, to the kids. And she would take them on camping trips and things that Franklin wasn't able to do anymore. And so she felt uh, that she really had to face her fears and really... Uh, overcome them so that she could do the things that she wanted to do. And one of the things that she was afraid of was uh, public speaking. And so, you know, she, she was said when she was younger that she really needed help learning how to 
to overcome that fear because she would get up in front of people when she first started giving public speeches and she would be very giggly and nervous. And um, her friend, Louis Howe, who was also a very good friend of her husband, Franklin's and his political advisor, he helped Eleanor learn how to give speeches and be confident and feel good about herself and not worry about making mistakes in front of people. And he told her to have something to say and say it and sit down instead of rambling and going on and on and maybe uh, making herself more and more nervous. So you can see from these pictures that she really uh, overcame that fear. She looks pretty happy uh, giving, uh, giving these speeches at the, the Democratic National Conventions that she, that she attended. And the one on that picture on the right is actually of Eleanor when she kind of took her husband's place and attended the Democratic National Convention and talked uh, to all the people there uh, sort of as, a, uh, as a, a replacement for Franklin who wasn't able to make it there that day. And she got a really big standing ovation. Everybody really loved her speech. So she was able to overcome that fear. And then some of, one of the other things that she did was, as you can see, she went up in an, an airplane and uh, many times she flew around the world, but uh, you can see some of the famous flights that she took. When Eleanor was younger, she was afraid of things like going on boats because she had gotten into a boat accident when she was very little and she was very nervous about that. Um, but she overcame her fears of traveling and, and doing things like that. And she was able to go up in the airplane and you can see her on uh, the picture on the left. That's when Eleanor is, uh, she's going up in the airplane with one of the Tuskegee pilots and uh, the Tuskegee Airmen were African-American pilots that uh, served during World War II, served our country. And so she, she seems pretty happy there. So you can see she's not too nervous about that even though it's a pretty small plane. And then that picture on the right is of Eleanor with uh, Amelia Earhart, who you might have learned about as one of the first women pilots in, in the country. And uh, so she went up in, in Amelia Earhart's plane and she looks pretty happy there too. So she doesn't seem too scared of, uh, of going up in, in, in little airplanes. And, and back then flying wasn't necessarily as safe as it is now. So she was pretty brave to, to do that. So uh, to wrap up what I wanted to talk to you about today with her fears, uh, to think about some of the things that Eleanor did even after uh, she was first lady, after her husband passed away, and when Eleanor was serving in the United Nations and uh, really traveling around the world and trying to help uh, promote causes like the civil rights. And uh, she was able to travel around the country. You can see her in her car here. She liked to drive her own car when she was younger and she really didn't want the Secret Service to come with her. And so she would travel around the country uh, in, in her car and she would travel down south and places where she was teaching people about how to uh, pr promote causes like civil rights and encourage other people to care about the rights that everybody had so that everybody would have the same rights, no matter what color their skin was, if they were a girl or a boy or what, what religion they were. And she would travel to these places. And sometimes people would be really angry at her because they didn't want change to happen. And in some cases, her life was in danger when she was making these trips. So she was very brave and she was able to accomplish things like she created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you can see her very proudly displaying on the right side as one of the things that she did. So kind of like the, the Declaration of Independence that we have in this country, uh, this is really a declaration that the United Nations adopted that's meant to apply to the whole world. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very proud of that. So she was able to accomplish some really great things despite being pretty, a pretty nervous and scared little girl. So it's something to think about even if you're afraid of something when you're younger, you're gonna be able to, um, to face your fears and, and accomplish some pretty great things. So uh, if you want to put in the chat, if there was ever a time when you were afraid of something, but when you faced your fear, you realized it wasn't as scary as you thought. So maybe there was something that you were really afraid of that maybe you're not anymore. So uh, you can share that with us in the chat. And I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Jen, to Ranger Jen, who is going to uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the other things that Eleanor Roosevelt did, the really brave things that she did over the course of her life when she stood up to people and, and faced her fears. Thank you, Ranger Danny. I remember not liking uh, jumping into the pool. And once I did it and got over it, yeah, maybe that first time was scary, but you do it and you get over it and then you're ready to jump into the pool again. So, Thank you. As we um, as we were just talking about Eleanor Roosevelt and how um, how good she was about uh, caring about people and making sure that people were treated fairly 
Um, I'm wondering if anybody in our uh, in our group here knows who the lady is that Eleanor Roosevelt is talking to and laughing with in this picture. I don't know if anybody has access to the chat. Um, this is a, a pretty famous woman related to Eleanor Roosevelt and her legacy and how we remember her. And one of the big events that happened in Washington, D.C. during the time that Eleanor Roosevelt was first lady. Uh, the woman on the right is a famous singer named Marian Anderson. And she and Eleanor um, became friends over the years. Eleanor invited her to come and perform at the White House on a couple of occasions. And it was a really big deal um, because Miss, Miss Marian had traveled all over the world and sung and, and performed in so many different places. And she really wanted to come to perform in Washington, D.C. The problem was that Washington in the 1930s was still a very segregated city and people couldn't just go wherever they wanted. Um, there were buildings and schools, for instance, that were, were designated for African-Americans and schools that were designated for um, folks who were white and they didn't really mix. And so the, the very best concert hall available to uh, Miss Marion to perform in Washington DC was called Constitution Hall, ironically enough. And um, every time they tried to book Miss Marion at Constitution Hall, her manager was told that it was booked for another occasion or something else was going on. And eventually it turned out that um, she wasn't able to perform there because she was an African-American. And that got a, a number of people fired up um, and got them thinking about uh, where could Miss Marion perform that would be um, a good place to, to have her be heard by lots of people. And someone suggested perhaps the Lincoln Memorial as an outdoor venue um, to have her standing there, as you can see in this picture with the Lincoln statue behind her, um, a, a, a statue of, of a president who represented freedom and emancipation for African-Americans enslaved. Um, this seemed like the ideal spot. And, and for us here on the National Mall, this is one of the first places, one of the first times we see this place being used for this purpose. And so this is a really, uh, a monumental occasion and Miss Eleanor had a lot to do with that. Um, as it turns out, Eleanor Roosevelt was a member of the organization that, that owned the building. Constitution Hall was owned by the Daughters of the American Revolution and Eleanor Roosevelt had to really decide. Um, Ranger Kevin talked about her My Day columns. She actually debates this in one of her own, own columns around this time where she's deciding whether it's more important to, to stand up for what you believe in and fight to change an organization from the inside or whether she should just quit this organization altogether. And so I wonder if you've ever had that occasion where you've had to think about how to handle a situation. Um, and I don't know if y'all have talked before about primary sources, but one of my favorite primary sources is the letter that Eleanor Roosevelt wrote to decide finally to resign and quit her membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution. I love that it's it's typed out the way you see it here on the screen and that maybe she had to add some things and underline some things or maybe those were done later. Um, but there's some really neat, neat uh, a really neat feel to this letter um, of February of 1939. And, you know, she says, I really haven't been a very active member in your organization, the Daughters of the American Revolution or a group of, of folks who can trace their, their um, families all the way back to the beginning of this country. And so, you know, very patriotic. It seems very, very, um, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to fit that they would have this policy. Um, uh, and she even says here, I am in complete disagreement with the attitude taken in refusing Constitution Hall to a great artist. And uh, I think the best line is right at the end of that second paragraph, you had an opportunity to lead in an enlightened way. And it seems to me that your organization has failed. Miss Eleanor knew how to, how to tell the truth there. Um, she really put it down into, into words that, that really uh, get to the heart of this issue. And so Eleanor would quit her membership the Daughters of the American Revolution. And that kind of made this a bigger news story because now she's involved and that led to, you know, the folks in the White House being, no, knowing about this incident and what might've been a pretty quiet story became a bigger deal when she got involved. And so she used her name and her position as first lady to make a stand for, for civil rights. The idea that, um, that 
Marian Anderson should not have been denied the chance to sing in this building. And yet this event at the Lincoln Memorial becomes a really um, big moment for us here in the, in the history of the National Mall. Uh, this isn't the only time Ms. Eleanor would stand up for civil rights. We talked uh, about the Tuskegee Airmen and people thought that the African-American pilots shouldn't have that opportunity. And she said, hey, I'm gonna go flying with them. And she also made friends with this lady, Miss Mary McLeod Bethune, who um, worked out of Washington, DC. She was very involved in, in Franklin Roosevelt's um, unofficial cabinet and uh, had a lot of um, things in common with Miss Eleanor about having, uh, believing in education. Mary McLeod Bethune started a university in Florida. Um, she has a national park site here in Washington, DC that you can go visit. And they would spend a lot of time together um, and one of the one of the great stories of that demonstrates how Miss Eleanor felt about this was when she goes to a, a conference down in Birmingham, Alabama. We think Washington DC was a segregated city. Uh, well, Alabama in the 1930s would have certainly been pretty segregated. And so she goes to this conference and they've literally said, um, white people on one side, black people on the other side. And when Eleanor went to sit down, she of course wanted to support her friend, Miss Mary McLeod Bethune. She sits on the side with the um, African-Americans and she's actually tapped on the shoulder and asked to, to move. You're in the wrong section. This isn't where you're supposed to sit. And she took her chair and she put it in the aisle and said, this is, you know, this is where I'm gonna sit as a way to say, you can't tell me where to sit based on on this uh, particular criteria. So that's pretty that's pretty impressive. A woman standing up for or sitting down in this case for what she believed in. Um, I think Ranger Danny talked about her her fear of public speaking. Can you get a bigger stage than this one? Here we are at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, and this is 1947. So I think it's really um, Worth noting that Eleanor Roosevelt is no longer the first lady. Um, I'm guessing by this point she is involved with the United Nations, but she's standing on the steps here at the Lincoln Memorial. And for a woman who would have been afraid to give a public speech, this would be a big deal. And so um, we have students who come to, to the Lincoln Memorial and give speeches on these steps. And it's a very memorable thing to be able to stand here and, and speak on the Lincoln steps. And for her to have been afraid to do so and to, uh, to be here standing on those, on those steps to speak in front of all these people. This was a meeting of the um, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This was Harry, President Harry Truman invited her to, to come and be a part of this. So um, overcoming your fears is, is what we're seeing and standing up for what you believe in are things that were really representative of, of Eleanor Roosevelt. And as we're thinking about her birthday and her legacy today, this is some really um, neat ideas and things to think about as far as she's concerned. And her legacy, no better place to talk about that than in, in Washington DC too, except maybe in Valkyll. Um, but we have this statue on the National Mall. This is part of the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial. And if you've never been to see this memorial, it is, it is spread out over um, seven and a half acres. And it's, um, as you heard, FDR was elected four times. And so there are these four outdoor rooms with a, an introductory room dealing with the fact that FDR suffered from polio as president before he was president. Um, and so it's really unusual, almost unheard of, there's nowhere else in the National Mall anywhere where you find the statue of a first lady included as part of a memorial. And not just, you know, next to the president, but she's in her own space. She's in the fourth room because she was found worthy of her own statue and her own space because of all the work she did. And you heard a lot of the things how she, she would help FDR as president, but she would also um, stand up for these causes. And so we see this as being really a, a big part of of, of her legacy. And so uh, as we've had this chance to, to share with you certain aspects of, of Eleanor Roosevelt, her life, her fears, her overcoming her fears, and how we remember her today, are there things that you most admire about Eleanor Roosevelt? Does anybody have anything they might want to throw in the chat box and share with us about Eleanor Roosevelt and what you like most about her, what you admire, 
um, anything you might want to, uh, to share or any questions that you might have about Eleanor. a really cool lady. I agree. I admire a lot of things about her. And it's always fun for me uh, when students come here to, to ask them after we talk a little bit about her and all the things that she did uh, to talk about the things that they admire about her. Because everybody kind of has a different thing that they, that they really like. A lot of times uh, I guess I'm surprised by some of the answers that I get from students. Can you remember something particularly memorable that surprised you? Well, uh, they're always really surprised about how many books she wrote. So um, especially because she didn't have a computer. So a lot of the time students say to me, oh my goodness, how did she uh, write all those books? She wrote three autobiographies and, and more than two dozen other books. And she, uh, she was able to do that before she had uh, a computer uh, or even um, she wasn't even really that uh, much of a typer. She had uh, someone who helped her with that, right? So she had a secretary that helped her. So I'm always, it's always funny to me that uh, when kids ask where her computer was in the house, when I tell them about all the, the writing that she did. And when we talk about how she wrote her newspaper column six days a week, they, a lot of students think that she could have just written it and then emailed the column in, but that's not how it worked um, back then. So it's, that's always interesting that to is me. Fun. Yeah. I'm looking at the, the TV set behind you and I'm thinking that doesn't look like my TV set at home either. <laughs> That's another thing that students, a lot of times when uh, I tell them that they're gonna see a TV when they come inside and, they, and a lot of times they come in and they're like, where's the TV? They look all around and sometimes there's that also a really big radio in there and they'll point to that first. They won't even realize that that's a television. Okay, so we do have a question about what each of us admire most about Eleanor Roosevelt. Who wants to go first? I'll jump in. Go ahead. I, I feel that she was a champion for those who didn't have a voice at that time. Um, you know, she stood up for children's rights, women's rights, civil rights, humanitarian concerns at a time when that wasn't a popular thing to do. And, you know, at a time when take, uh, doing that and taking that chance could put your life in jeopardy. She had a $25,000 bounty on her head from the KKK at one point, um, you know, for, for traveling to the South. And, um, you know, I think uh, she didn't care. She, she stood up for what she thought was right. Yeah. I, I admire that uh, about her, the, the, all that, all the things that we talked about today with her overcoming her fears for me, that's always been a really big deal. So some of the things that Kevin talked about that she did, but just, uh, for me, just the, the little things that she was afraid of and how she was able to overcome all of that. And so she said when she was younger, at that quote I read before, where she said, looking back, that she everything that she did, there was kind of this barrier in front of her of fear. But when she was older, when she wrote in her autobiography um, later on, that there was really nothing left that could scare her. She said that uh, there was really, uh, she had reached a point in her life that there was no living person that she feared and there were few challenges uh, that she felt that she was not willing to face so for me uh, I, I really admire that because I was when I was younger and even as an adult I have uh, struggled with having um, anxiety which a lot of people have and I always talk to, to students about that because it's something that's uh, a problem for a lot of people and I learned that Eleanor Roosevelt was right that every time you're afraid of something, if you face it and, and you, you face it head on and you, and you get past it, you look back at it and you realize that it really wasn't that scary to begin with. And, and so she's been really a mentor to me. Yeah, that's great. I remember being a very, very shy kid. And when I tell people that they're often very surprised because I don't come across as very shy anymore. And I just think that it really is, um, she really is like this role model that you can look to and be like, wow, look at all these things that she had to deal with. I mean, losing her parents very young and, you know, having a fairly dysfunctional family and, um, you know, marrying into this family and having to deal with, with, you know, that new dynamic and just all the things that she did. I'm thinking of, of this photograph and there are a great photograph of her like coming off of a plane or a train or something. And she's just carrying her suitcases by herself as like a, as like an older lady. And you're like, wow, this, 
nothing phases her. She just goes and does it. And, and I feel like that story about moving her chair is just a really, you know, just a simple little thing that you can do that can make just a huge impact. And um, yeah, and I just, I love talking about how she handled the Marian Anderson story. I love that, you know, one of the things about that concert is it's this huge big deal. 75,000 people came to, to hear that concert and Eleanor chose to stay away and not attend because she didn't want the focus to be on her. She wanted the focus to be where it belonged on Miss Marian Anderson. And so just even little things like that, that she, um, she thought about and, and quite an amazing, quite an amazing lady. She was, it's really, it's really, when you look back through all her accomplishments, it's almost kind of hard to believe that, you know, one person was able to do all those things, especially back then. Um, like Kevin yeah. was saying, it, you were putting your life in danger to to stand up for for things like civil rights back then, and and she wasn't afraid to do that. And that's really something I like to talk to students about and everybody about how she how thinking about how when she was younger she's so scared of so many things, but then look at what she accomplishes, what she's able to do. So it really is a a, a sort of a story for everybody to know that even if maybe there are some things that you're nervous about or scared about when you're younger, that doesn't mean that it's gonna keep you from doing the things that you wanna do or, or making an impact, or maybe even having a statue like Eleanor Roosevelt yep. has uh, of herself someday. Yep. Well, this is great. This is a great way to kick off a, a Friday afternoon and a great way to um, get you thinking about Eleanor Roosevelt. Her birthday is Tuesday, right? Yes. And um, we hope that uh, this has been a maybe an introduction to Eleanor and her life. And maybe you want to learn more. Maybe you want to come visit us, uh, Washington, D.C. at the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial Hyde Park. You can learn so much about the Roosevelts there. I grew up not too far away, so I've been there a whole bunch of times. And there's some great stuff to see there. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll have a chance to to come out and uh, and join us at, at some of these sites and and maybe be inspired to go check out a, a My Day column or uh, maybe a little YouTube video about Eleanor Roosevelt and think about her this weekend as she would be celebrating her or what her anniversary, her 138th anniversary. You know, put um, a plug in on uh, Tuesday yeah. if you're local. Um, we do have a, a graveside ceremony to celebrate her birth with a a speaker and a birthday cake again this year, finally. Gosh, I wish I was closer. I'd come for cake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. Well, great. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, thank you to Kevin and Danny for, for working on this with me. Thank you to um, Edward and Aaron at the Trust for the National Mall for hosting us. And, um, you know, we look forward to joining you again, maybe for another program. Uh, FDR's birthdays in January. Maybe we'll we'll gather again for that. So thank you all very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.